Uh, let's move to the uh, to the discussion itself to to, uh, to, to our roundtable. Um, all right, so uh, I give the uh, hosting rights to um, Katarina. Uh, Katarina, let me see. Do I do I see you? Ah, yeah, you're here, right? Yes. So, um, and please, um, the screen is yours. Uh, if you uh, if you would be. Yeah, I'm just going to give the floor very quickly. But um, so. Always in this matching and practice uh, workshops, we have a roundtable on a practical topic. Um, and, and this time we wanted to discuss a topic that we've never discussed before and that is uh, very relevant for us. Um, and if you think about it, so it's the econ job market. And um, if you think about its origins um, in the 70s, basically there was nothing, no information aggregation any of any sort. And um, over time, things have improved um, with information about posts uh, being centralized and the application procedure being centralized. And then uh, the signaling procedure uh, proposed in 2005 uh, by, by Al and the committee. And, um, and since then, there's been relatively little action, if you think about it. Um, there's, we've expanded how much we advice um, on any many other markets and uh, we thought it would be useful to understand why we're not doing more than what we're proposing for others to do um, in particular why are we not centralizing fully the market um, and this actually was triggered very much by Andrew Johnson Johnston who was um, coming from the outside you know looking at what we're doing and saying so we're designing matching procedures for all these other markets. Why are we not doing it for ourselves? It seems like we should do it as well. And then um, I, and he was cautious enough to say, maybe we should just apply a recommender system because then we just, you know, maybe create the right data and then we can start evaluating how well we can do or not. You know, so I, I thought it was an amazing proposal that was worth discussing. So I'm super happy to have Andrew, but also to have um, a bunch of very, uh, you know, knowledgeable people, uh, people who think carefully and I'm hopeful that the audience will help us also in creating further discussions. So we just have an initial set of uh, triggers. So the people that have either thought about it or, or were happy enough to accept the invitation to think um, slightly about the topic. Um, so we're going to start with a 10 minutes presentation, uh, a little bit of or either presentation or thoughts of the different um, participants and then we're going to open the floor and we can all uh, in an orderly manner uh, discuss the topic. Okay, so we're going to start with Andrew uh, Johnson, who was the trigger of the whole issue. Andrew. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> Let me just make sure I have this right. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be with you. I admire uh, Matchers so much. And it's a great pleasure to be among you and to listen to you and, and hear your thoughts and your feedback about how you could incorporate potentially matching into the uh, market, the labor market for economists. I think this is just a wonderful group. Um, so before I start, I should just give you two disclaimers. One is that we're in the middle of a big move and the kids have been up all night every night. So I am a little bit groggy. I just, uh, it's 7 a.m. here and um, I have a splitting headache. So I'm sorry for that. And the second is I should just say that I'm coming at it from a slightly uh, different angle, which is that I'm traditionally a labor economist. So in this area, I'm a pilgrim uh, to matching rather than a priest of matching. So I just am very much looking forward to learning from you all. So today, I'm just going to outline some of my thinking on a feasible way to incorporate matching principles in, a, in the labor market for economists. And my adventures in this area started when I noticed how difficult matching was for both sides of the market. So very quickly, it's hard for candidates to credibly signal their interest to departments. And it's very hard for departments to figure out which candidates are attainable in part because they just don't have 
uh, enough of the relevant information. They would need to know what candidate preferences were and they would need to know the preferences of all of their competitors, all of the competing employers. And, and I'm so sorry. And the, the main thing that I would like to say is that I think that there's a way to use the principles of matching to form a recommender system that helps to facilitate good matches between employers and candidates. So um, you might think of kind of the prima facie question is whether it's a good idea whether matching could reasonably improve the outcomes of the allocations from in the labor market. And in, in some ways it's an empirical question where we would just need to study how those allocations worked with and without matching and to what extent they were satisfying uh, various goals. But I think that there's some intuitive experience that the ingredients for coordination failure permeate the job market for economists in really predictable ways. Um, so, you know, in, in my reading, coordination failure is fundamentally about a lack of information. Candidates can't credibly signal their interest. And without reliable information on preferences, employers have to do a lot of guesswork. And their guesswork is basically this. When they're looking at a candidate they really like, they're wondering who else will like this candidate and will the candidate prefer us to the competitor uh, employer? And here, mistaken guesswork uh, leads to suboptimal matching. So if you imagine the, the core of the solution, there's basically one candidate who's the best candidate that's actually attainable, that will actually accept an offer from the school. So that's a quite, quite a narrow corridor for, um, for optimality. So maybe they're close to optimal, but, but I, I don't know. It seems unlikely that they're doing the exact right thing. Um, so what, can, what could be done about it? Uh, you know, in, in some sense, the ideal answer is a centralized matching mechanism that resolves the coordination failure in full. Um, but in practice, markets don't tend to take up this option because it's quite hard to get all the participants in a labor market to commit to living by the assignment of a match. Uh, so one alternative would be to use the principles of matching to create a recommender system. Uh, and the virtue here is that it marries the flexibility of a decentralized market with the information value produced by matching. So essentially the match recommendation would be aggregating all the information that we get from the preferences of both sides and provide um, some form of that information to employers so they know who are the, what is a set of the best attainable candidates, the candidates that are um, that, that the employer likes best that are unlikely to have a dominating option, an option that the, that the employer, that the candidate prefers. Um, so how would you generate these recommendations? This is just a simple way to do it that uh, which is how, how we did it in our little pilot. Uh, like other matches, we, would, uh, we elicited the preferences of candidates for employers and for, um, of employers for candidates. And what we want to do is provide a list of recommendations to employers ranked by match quality, however, however defined. And so uh, we, one way to do that is to run an iterative match, which is simply to take the preference rankings, run Gail Shapley, and produce the typical set of matches. And this first solution would provide the first recommendation to employers. And then you would remove all the solutions from the rank. So say I matched with Barcelona, I would be removed from Barcelona's rankings and Barcelona would be removed from my rankings. Then we would just rerun the match. And the match uh, there would be the second recommendation to employers. And then we would just iterate that uh, 30 times perhaps to recommend candidates uh, for the interview stage, or maybe five times to recommend candidates for the flyout stage. Um, so let me just walk through a really simple example if I have a, a second to do so, which is um, uh, let's imagine that Pompeo has lexicographical preferences. They just prefer people in alphabetical order and, and so this is a, a simplified kind of universe of five candidates. And so because it's 
their preferences are lexicographical. They prefer Anthony to Benedict, Benedict to Cyrus, Cyrus to Daphne, and Daphne to Eloise. And say we put this through the recommender system and it produces the following list. Um, so here, um, Cyrus is recommended first because Cyrus is the best candidate that wasn't preferred by a school that he preferred to Pompeo. So we, we call him the best available. And then these other candidates are sort of um, trembling hand recommendations. So imagine that Cyrus isn't available. Uh, his preferences change or the school's preferences change or he dies tragically. Um, uh, what, who, who are the people that would, would make uh, likely suitable matches that are, that are not Cyrus? And so those are just the, the, the those that, that came through after removing Cyrus and then removing Benedict and then removing Daphne and then removing Eloise. Uh, and I, I have, I can say a little bit more about that at the end if there's interest in, in who these backups are. So it's useful just to think about what's the, pro, what's the maximal, what's the best, what's the point of maximal benefit for introducing an intervention like a matching recommendation. So you could, you could, you could you, you, if you think about the market as kind of a funnel where you start with all the applicants and you funnel down to the interviews, to the flyouts, and to the offers, um, uh, you could provide recommendations at any of these arrow points, uh, one, two, and three. So kind of between the stages. Um, and later in the process, preferences are probably better formed by candidates and employers. But earlier in the process, much more selection takes place. And it's kind of permanent selection. If you're not interviewing people at most institutions, it's very difficult to go back and add them to the flyout list, for instance. Um, and it's also important to use nodes at which the market is already coordinated in time. So there isn't a natural clearing date, for instance, after flyouts and before offers, but there are natural concentrations in time before interviews because of central, you know, uh, because of, of interviewing at around uh, conferences and immediately after interviews. So they make a very natural point for uh, in intervention. Um, and then I, I don't know if I, have I might be out of time, but there are just, uh, these are kind of very typical good questions about uh, a recommender and whether it's uh, a good idea. And I'm happy to go through these, but I don't, I don't want to eat into other people's time. Yeah, you have four, 40 seconds. So. Okay, I'll, I'll, we can come back to these if there's interest. Exactly. I'll stop sharing. Very good. So uh, Dorothea, do you wanna go next? Yes, thank you. So I, mm, thanks a lot, uh, Andrew. I think that's a, it's a very interesting proposal and I would have liked to see your last slide but maybe we can, uh, we can see it later on. And I, I only have, a very, have very few comments, maybe taking a broader perspective first. So first of all, I think, I mean, given COVID, I think we are, probably undergoing a change in how this market is going to work. It uh, will be interesting to see this, but my impression is that um, departments will rely more on Zoom interviews uh, in the future than uh, they have uh, in the past. And um, because it has, of course, apparently lots of advantages, you can have the right people interview the candidates, right? Because it's not only the small group of people who goes to the meetings, but it's the, the, the experts in a field who, who can actually be present uh, for a certain candidate. So it has, has, uh, uh, has advantages in that respect. And that might increase the number of interviews that you can be doing. Uh, uh, and that, of course, will aggravate the congestion problem if you think about you know whom of, of these many interviewees should we now fly out so in that sense i think you're um, uh, you know doing something about this might be might be very important and might be become even uh, more important okay and uh, so i think it's very interesting uh, to think about it 
Now, um, one thing I was thinking about, it was uh, from a European perspective, of course, uh, uh, we have now established our own job market, which is always run in, uh, the in December, and uh, it's going to take place in Barcelona uh, this year, uh, earlier than, the, the, so it will be in the end of, end of December again, or mid-December. Mid and one question is, of course, you know, how, how, the, how, to, how to deal with this feature, right? That there, there are basically two uh, events when, you know, around which interviews will take place. Now, Zoom might again, you know, uh, make these uh, uh, specific dates less relevant, who knows? So, so there will be a, maybe an even longer period over which interviews will be conducted. And, uh, um, and of course, for the, such a recommender system that you're thinking of, uh, uh, one should think about how to, how to unify that in, in some way. Um, and my third point is something I think you, you wanted to talk about now on your third slide, and that's the, what are the incentives of people to participate? I think that's a, a very important issue and I, I haven't thought about it enough, I must admit, uh, but um, I, I want to stress one aspect. So, uh, if it's and and this is based on experience uh, with the German system for uh, university admissions, which is based on you know a DA mechanism, but where participation of universities uh, of and of programs uh, is voluntary. Okay, so uh, it, what mean what this means is that actually over time participation has increased, but. Um, uh, it's still the case that many programs are not part of it. And, but this is not a recommender system, but this is this system produces the matching. Now, what happened was that in the first years, is, uh, programs were just making as many offers as they would make, uh, not having uh, you know, programs outside of the system, which meant that uh, they could not fill their seats because lots of people then rejected these offers because they had outside options, so to say, from programs outside of it. Uh, so the universities now had to learn that in spite of this being a DA mechanism, they have to overbook a lot, uh, actually, because there are all these outside option programs, right? And this effect of having voluntary participation of making it quite hard actually for participants to, to learn how to deal with the fact that not everybody is part of it um, is something that I think would be very important also to factor in for this recommender system. So you would have to teach, I looked at your tutorials and I, I really like them, but I think you would have to teach the programs uh, uh, that, you know, what does it mean if only a certain portion of students is actually taking uh, part of uh, is taking part, uh, so there there are students who are not in it. Uh, how how should I deal with that? And and similarly, of course, for for the students. So um, I think this is this is a, a practical aspect that that might be uh, quite relevant. Uh, and of course, it uh, 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 this has to do with the question of uh, uh, what the incentives are, how many people will participate, uh, which is a much deeper issue that I'm just uh, you know. I'm, I'm not going to address, but I'm sure others will, will talk about it. So these are where my three comments, and I, now I'm happy to hand over on hand back to Katarina, uh, who's the boss. Um, All right. So Itai, if you want, it's your turn now. Um, yeah. So I think a recommend a, a recommender system is. Um, I think is interesting. It's also relevant in other marketplaces now, like in the in residency matching, there's a lot of, uh, over there, there's a lot of complaints about lots of uh, uh, requests, uh, lots of interviews, in, but in the residency match or fellowship matching, what's going on is that lots of doctors are interviewing in many places, but they don't pay for their interviews. In the, in the academic environment, we fly them out. It's a slightly different story, so we have less incentive to invite a lot. I agree with Dorothea that the Zoom is going to, at least for Skype interviews or like uh, initial interviews, it's going to change, I think, what's going to happen. I think a lot more, even American universities will start uh, interviewing online now. And, and uh, not everyone, but... It sounds to me very tempting not to go to the AA meetings and just do the flexible interviewing online, but let's see. Um, 
but the recommender says so in the in the residency matching um i have a little bit of uh, so we, we wrote a short perspective and working on something related now um but over there uh um having, for example, a signaling market is not enough to, to help doctors to decide where to go to interview. I think here, the interview match, what it helps is to somehow give confidence for both sides that both sides are interested. So in the, in the signaling, when we send us two signals, for example, for in the, in the economics job market, that shows interest from the from the student, from the candidate, but not so much giving the candidate a lot of confidence not to go on interviews that they got invited to. Um, and I think that's, that's the issue of having too many interviews. But now I think in the academic job market, having too many interviews is not so much of, a, of an issue. Uh, okay, there's a few people who get a lot of interviews, but, but I don't know if an interview uh, recommender system in a, in a job market is gonna necessarily resolve this, if departments should know somehow whether they have chances or not better than in places like the residency. Um, yeah, for, for, I think it's a good idea for, for initial interviews maybe uh, to help mush, signal more interest from both sides. For the actual flyouts, I'm, I think there's a lot more information that departments can figure out beforehand and maybe a, a recommender system is less, is less of uh, interest, I think. Uh, and definitely there's the issue of competition uh, where it's gonna hard to get everyone on board uh, to participate, but I don't know, but it could be an interesting experiment. I know also that in the, in the Israel uh, law market for residencies, they, they try to do something like this. Uh, Asaf Ram has been uh, writing about this, that uh, in some sort of recommender that's on over time, uh, different kinds of uh, law firms joined it, starting, I think, from the most prestigious, I'm, I'm not mistaken, but I'm not 100%. Um, I think in the, Amer in the academic journal, there's just so much more information about both the schools and the can and which would be maybe harder to get everybody on board. Mm. I, I can see where you're coming from. <laughs> for other people, it's not so easy. <laughs> for you guys, you probably talk, you know, we meet for coffee and talk to each other. But for uh, like, I think there's a, like the top, which I think raises a very important question, like for whom this is most relevant or less, but we'll get to that. I don't want to abuse my powers here. Um, so maybe Laura now, Laura. Your turn. Hi. So thank you for having me here and hi to everyone. And thank you, Andrew, for uh, first suggesting this and, and also for the brief presentation. Um, so I am, I'm very young to have like many opinions on the job market, but I guess Andrew said something um, that really stuck with me, which is we could potentially be accumulating lots of data on how actually how bad or good our job market is running. I, I think we all know someone or have our own version of a horror story or not, but we don't know necessarily how bad the inefficiencies are or the miscoordinations are uh, rel relative to what we think. And I think that you, something that we could an intervention in quote unquote intervention that we could think of doing uh, to understand what parts could use improving could be just to get data, try to form a database of where people are interviewing, uh, where did they apply? Because you could imagine like lots of people applying to places that they would never go to just out of the panic and because it's free to apply. And even if that doesn't necessarily generate an inefficiency, you could think that for some departments having to go through many, many applications that potentially they are not going from candidates that are not really interested, that's already like uh, a sign that of like things we could improve. But it would be good to have a quantitative sense of the degree of congestion or miscoordination beyond like our 
the, I guess the, the, the anecdotal evidence. I'm not saying that, that it's not there, but I think looking at the data might help us understand what part of the process needs, um, needs improving. And one thing I would be, I, I agree with Dorothea that there's like the, this practical thing of like, not only having the schools participate and understand how this works, but also what I would worry is what is the implications for the candidates? Because you could imagine that a school all of a sudden they go to an interview, they interview this person, they are super excited and all of a sudden this person doesn't appear in their recommendation and they might negatively update. So there's a lot of like signaling and information and like things that we would model best through non-cooperative behavior that I'm not sure how, um, how we could incorporate it like to make it safe to, to participate. Like I had former classmates from the PhD ask me about these aspects of Andrew's proposal and, and, their, and this was a big concern, like how the message will be or the lack thereof would be uh, interpreted. Um, all right. Those are my two cents. <laughs> Thank you. Very nice. Uh, Alex. Uh, thank you so much. It's hard to go last uh, in part because everything interesting has already been said. So I can just repeat the interesting things. But I'm, I'm grateful to uh, Catherine for inviting me uh, to this. Um, let me throw a couple of uh, random intellectual hand grenades and see if they kind of explode or not. <laughs> so one is kind of echoing what um, Laura was saying, which is, do we actually have a problem? I mean, compared to other disciplines, we run the most extraordinary job market um, of anybody. I mean, from physicists to historians, nobody seems to get it as right as I think we do in economics. We've centralized the things we've thought we could centralize. We've kept some things um, enjoyable, like going to the AEAs and doing interviews, if, if you've done that. Um, and um, it sort of seems to work all right. We have about a thousand candidates in a thousand positions and the market clears. And so maybe actually the problem isn't there. So I, I think it's actually important to know, you know do we actually have a problem um, uh, uh, to fix? Um, the way I thought from Andrew's presentation, um, this thing would work as a recommender system. And you know, since um, maybe this is one thing we can brainstorm is a kind of a typical way in which a lot of data startups work, which is in order to be able to get access to the data, you have to contribute the data. And that typically induces participation quite a bit, right? So um, I've worked with a forestry startup and in order to be able to get data on other people's kind of um, land, you have to contribute data on your own land. Um, and so that's basically the cost of participation is submitting the data to them. Then they crunch it and they give you some, um, some data-based product that's on the base of it. This is very similar, right? You can imagine that in order to participate rather than having to pay something, what you're doing, you would be paying in data. So in fact, I've just got the, um, uh, email uh, came in 10 minutes ago, which is about the job market placements of uh, candidates from Oxford. David, congratulations. Um, and, um, and we could submit that kind of data maybe on the course of the last 10 years, which of course most departments collect. We could submit it to Andrew and then he could crunch it um, and then actually give us something useful uh, from the bigger database that he would have. So I think that would work. Um, and so here is a couple of things that I think makes this a little bit more complicated. Um, one of them, so we, this is maybe salient to some places, though not others, is we actually, in Oxford, for example, we hire quite a few positions every year. Um, and I know some places only hire one position uh, usually, but I think there's quite a few universities that hire many positions. And with that, it's not just... Um, uh, our preferences are basically not really responsive, okay? Um, you cannot as much as I wish to hire three perfect, brilliant micro theorists uh, every year, you have to hire people in macro and you have to worry about other constraints, of course, like diversity constraints and so on. And so all of these things kind of ultimately when you have, I think two or three positions every university thinks about as a kind of portfolio problem. And so actually submission of preferences is very difficult for the universities but I think it's also difficult for the candidates. It's actually very hard to rank a hundred universities, right? When I was on the job market, I made 
110 applications, I would find it very hard to rank, you know, the vast majority of these between them. It was basically, can I please have a job? Um, and the other issue that comes with it, and that's again, part of the, part of the kind of slight skepticism I have about how easy it's going to, to make this product fly is the complexity of contracts that you often have. So Oxford is quite peculiar. If, if those of you know it, we kind of have department jobs, but they're tied to colleges. And so very complex contracts because they're really between two employers, but it more generally, right? You bargain with your employer over all sorts of terms. So you might bargain over salary, over research allowance, over teaching reduction, et cetera, et cetera. And these things are not typically gonna be made public. I definitely do not go around telling people how what my research allowance is, right? Um, because it might be so enormous that it would dwarf your salaries, right? It, it was obviously not, but you know, this obviously happens in some universities that some of our colleagues have research allowances than larger than other people's salaries. And so this data is hard to get. Um, and, um, and I think that, that uh, affects the ranking and that therefore affects what you learn from the data, right? And so that's a kind of big, I think, source of potential um, error. Um, that, 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 that you get. Um, yeah, and then the last thing I think it's been raised, but I wrote it down beforehand and I thought I'd kind of emphasize it, kind of the timing is a crucial thing. I think preferences actually change um, across the job market. I think we like to think of them as being fixed, but I sort of really think that the, um, it's, and it's not just resolution of uncertainty. I think there's a kind of, you, you start out by thinking, oh, we would like to, you know, get a macro person and a micro person and a historian one year. And then you sort of realize um, that maybe this is not the best year to, to do that. And you start thinking, actually, maybe I'm, 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 I can maybe remove, move some resources and actually end up um, having a couple of uh, micro theorists instead, right? So some of it is, of course, resolution uncertainty, but others is just, you know, kind of the, the um, universities adapt. So it's hard to know kind of exactly when this happens. And that's another thing that seems to add the error. So that's, that's kind of it. So I, I hope it was not too pessimistic because I am trying to uh, problem solve it, right? So I'm suggesting how it could work, but I think it's actually quite a difficult proposition. Um, and in any case, we need to kind of definitely know, like Laura said, that um, we have a problem here to solve. Very good. I think it would be interesting whenever we think about our own market to think about like we all have our own markets that we're constantly thinking about to think about how different is it? How different are the problems that the economist market has? How are they different than what the school choice or any other matching market has? You know, the firms also have multiple positions and schools definitely have more than positions and peer effects definitely are a huge problem that we're sort of, um, you know, ignoring because it's very convenient mathematically. Um, so there's a responsiveness and um, information about the other side. You don't have that either. So submitting an exam is a problem. Um, so I think many of the problems that um, we think apply to us apply to other markets. So I, the, the reason why I'm super interested in just thinking about it is because it will humble us down a little bit more in maybe understanding how the other markets, you know, it will make us better understand what the challenges are and maybe improve the way we can um, provide advice. It will make us more sensible to things because I think many of the problems are just very similar. And just very briefly, so uh, when I was when I got out of the market, I was not a matching person, but then I had to choose school for my kids and uh, it was a centralized procedure. It was the Boston mechanism. And then I played it and I saw the papers about it and I was like, oh, my God, what, the, what are these people talking about? Um, and then that's how I got into it. And that basically all the papers I wrote are basically about my experience. OK, so I think knowing well the market just makes you more aware of what the problems may be because you just have all these things very much in you that basically will not allow you to say that certain things are not important or will not allow you to make certain assumptions because you basically know these are too big to, to do. No? So I think it's a very, very interesting exercise to do even to arrive at the conclusion that maybe we should not be recommending matching procedures so abruptly. Uh, maybe we should be recommending more recommender systems and then slowly understand the markets better and have enough data. Uh, do you really have a problem become, before I come in and say, you must have a problem because I am a matching person and I really want you to have a problem because I want to give you advice. 
Um, so I just think it, whenever we say anything, I think it would be really interesting to see why this is not like a big issue in one of the main, in the main um, applications that we tend to provide advice to. So I think now it's time, like people can just, I think if we are ordered, we can just participate. Um, yeah. Can I make a point about this? Very interesting things. Oh, is this Itai's turn? Sorry. No, no, no. no. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I just saw the screen around it. So uh, these are very interesting questions. So of course, uh, I'm a bit older than uh, many of you here. So I've thought about this problem very early on because my, I, uh, I literally started working on matching through labor markets and uh, matching through labor markets. And one common issue of those labor markets uh, we see is that uh, where they use centralized matching mechanisms is that uh, they actually, all the interview stages, the things like, uh, we are right now talking about centralizing or creating a clear hours are done in a very decentralized way. Uh, there could be some common uh, boards, but these are uh, like I'm uh, thinking about uh, this NRMP matching or uh, other kind of young professionals to very highly specialized markets like uh, federal clerks, etc. Uh, in for uh, uh, appellate judges uh, in the United States. Uh, so these are done, so interviews are not really centralized in those uh, uh, places, but just the matching stage, the last stage where you rank the people uh, in a list are literally centralized. And then the match is uh, created based on that. So, uh, and there is this, all this information feature, of course, our uh, market is uh, uh, not as temporary as those matches where it lasts only a couple of years. This leads to a much longer term uh, commitment, uh, maybe lifetime commitment at some cases due to after tenure, et cetera. So uh, uh, there is more information issues, literally, maybe that could be a result in the, even in the interview stage in our market. But uh, my thoughts had been that, uh, do we have problems in the coordination clearing stage, in the second stage, where after all interviews are done, all flights are, uh, flights are done, do we, I think, I believe that we, uh, we have issues in that and the way we make offers in the last minute or last, there is a problem even in that stage. Uh, I believe that because again, uh, Laura is absolutely right. Maybe this is just an anecdotal <laughs> feeling, but the way we, how we rank candidates, how we go from candidate to candidate, even if we are going to make three or four offers uh, in a row, there's this ordering and there's all this timing issue of other people's offers going to expire, this happened, that happened. Even that stage has a lot of problems. So even uh, creating an orderly stage for that, which due to reasons Alex thought about are quite difficult, uh, could be a big improvement. Uh, and I mean, I agree, recommendation system is uh, for the, I guess you're thinking the whole whole process, the recommendation system is very nice, very uh, good. But uh, I would like, to, I mean, what do you guys think about uh, in general about just the clearing stage, not, uh, not even the other parts? I have a question related to that too. I'm happy to kind of defer to, but uh, sorry to jump in. So, so I'm sorry, so I, I, I think, so let's just raise hands and I will make sure that I take turns so that we, um, so we tie, raise his hand and, and then Alex. Yeah, so I think, yeah, I, I do think that in the clearing stage there is issues, but at the same time, um, it's going to hard to get candidates who, who now suppose they're getting two offers, what are you, they still want to make decisions uh, and and take the time to figure out, to visit. And I don't see, at least in many universities or many candidates stopping that, the recruit me, recruiting and uh, exploring more of your options. Uh, even so, 
there may be some way. I'm not sure if a ma clearing match will solve this, but there might be a different mechanism to to try to speed that process. Um, one thing I, I, I want to say about uh, a little bit cynical and kind of uh, when I look at the successful uh, uh, stories of market design in school choice, I'm kind of maybe shooting my own uh, branch here, is that the success stories of centralized matching are in places that we, um, people really have to match, like kids have to go to school. Uh, and then we have a fully centralized uh, system. And I agree with Utku completely that a lot of the information is aggregated much more, much before and that stage we don't understand a lot. And I think, I do think that if there's value, there is a lot of value to see if there's a lot of congestion in the interviewing stage. Uh, uh, for a clearing, for a uh, clearing house, it's not that someone really needs to get to hire a, uh, uh, so, uh, to hire a new faculty, a, a department really has to hire a new faculty. Otherwise, they would just hire someone and figure out. Or a student has to get a job. They can. There's all kinds of there's an outside option. In the school, in schools, we really need the kids to go to schools, and that's I think a huge difference. And then I think the national residency matching program is similar. They came up with a system because they really needed the. Uh, to, to place those doctors in um, uh, and to fill positions much more than we need to fill faculty positions, I think. Um, but I, I, I think there is a lot of still congestion in in the interviewing stage. That's that could be that's yeah. definitely. I do agree with that as well. I mean, even uh, measuring interest, all the anyway. Thank you. Bobby, you go first. You you just put your hand up too slowly. Uh, thanks, Alex. Thank, thanks, everyone. This is super interesting. Uh, I, I wonder if if maybe I could summarize a couple of the things and, and use that as a question. So it sounds like <clears throat> there were a lot of uh, a lot of concerns, kind of by Alex and and Laura and and then um, kind of Utku and, and Itzai at the end, which is kind of like, well, you know, the game is maybe a little bit more complicated than we think. Uh, it's hard to know how to express preferences fully, so uh, maybe we shouldn't jump to, you know, be too hasty. Um, which I guess, you know, I kind of, uh, I find that really persuasive. Uh, I guess the concern there is like, well, why are we telling other people what to do? Um, I think Itai's point is a good one where maybe, you know, we have the luxury of we can uh, be a little bit, um, a little bit picky in, in faculty appointments. Uh, but the other thing is that, that I guess it seems like what a lot of this is going to is, well, it seems that the purpose of all of this stuff, and we've kind of moved in the direction of a recommender system in this conversation is, it seems like we might be able to use a matching algorithm to centralize information somehow. And, and I guess if that's the case, um, you know, what's the point of, I mean, why are we doing it this way, right? So if our goal is to centralize information, Presumably, there are better ways to centralize information than running a matching algorithm because you know there are ways that we have that are specifically based on centralizing information. So I wonder in a market like faculty admissions where we have something that looks like very correlated preferences on one side, we have something like a serial dictatorship in that sense, even if we ran a centralized matching mechanism. It doesn't seem like there's too many coordination problems that would arise once we have the information. And so I guess my question, and sorry for taking so long, is you know, if, if the role of, of everything we're doing is to centralize information, why don't we just, you know, forget all about uh, uh, matching practices and then, you know, do some kind of information aggregation system explicitly for that and then, you know, let people do a uh, very decentralized serial dictatorship, which I think would, uh, which would lead to uh, maybe a good allocation. So I'm sorry for, for the long-winded question. Thomas? Or Alex, sorry, yes. Alex. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, thanks, sorry. I just uh, s surrendered my position temporarily. Um, I guess um, it's just a reaction to what Utku said about, you know, can we, is it like the appellate judges thing and we can do the centralized matching at the end? It really does feel like, I mean, maybe my experience is special, but I, I doubt it. Uh, the contracts are very multidimensional here, right? There's so many terms that you do kind of need to haggle over. And I guess it's an issue of both uh, convincing the universities to, um, reveal what you're allowed to bargain over uh, 
in, uh, before the bargaining even takes place, right? Um, and actually for people to try and, right, to make these contracts explicit. So as I am, presumably with the appellate judges, there isn't too much negotiation. You just get matched to a judge and there's some salary that comes with it, right? If there isn't many, the, the, the problem is it, we have a lot of terms and these terms are very employer specific and maybe even employee employer match specific, right? So there's certain things that Stanford would negotiate with, with Laura, but they, they, but they, they would negotiate with, with Itai, right? Or whatever, right? So uh, if I may just uh, very briefly, because it's an important point, I guess this uh, for the junior market, so you were an associate professor, you don't count Alex. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for junior markets, uh, it's kind of, uh, I, I used to think it's of secondary nature, of course, uh, <laughs> maybe uh, I was so in the bottom of the ladder that <laughs> it didn't matter for me, but uh, uh, I guess uh, it depends, yeah, I mean, I hear you, but again, I guess it goes to the Itai's point, what are, and also uh, Katerina's point, what are the important differences? <laughs> And how can we even agree what the important differences are? Uh, yeah, anyway, thank you. Now, Tomas, yes. Thank you. So I, I went on the market this year. Uh, so, so I've been thinking about this centralization uh, quite a lot. It was a super tough market. A lot of things didn't work out that well, as you may expect. So I have some thoughts about this. So first, for the, I think we're doing a bit of a, we're being a bit idealistic with respect to the baseline, even though I agree that implementing this centralization is not going to be exactly the A in school choice. For instance, from the perspective of candidates, I applied to 150 places, okay? Um, and I have classmates who applied to more than 250 places. Some of those interviews were even for practicing. Okay, so they were not even intended to be a final match. It was just a practicing to improve in the end in the interview stage. Some candidates had more than 50 flyouts, and in the end, they are going to go to one job, right? So there is a lot of waste also, I think, and there are going to be winners and losers from the demand side, I suppose. Top universities maybe don't want to get constrained with the centralization. Middle tier universities and low tier universities could, I believe, benefit quite a lot. Uh, my impression is that what we have to avoid at, uh, the most is the problem when some students fall, fall through the cracks. People think that they are going to be super successful uh, or whatever, then they don't interview them uh, in the market. And in the end, uh, some of them, they don't even get a job. I have classmates who didn't get a job and I believe there are several universities that could be super happy to get them, but they are locked in already, the other universities. And finally, I just want to say that for the offering stage, I believe that there were there are two at least problems that, that could potentially be solved, not in a, a I, I don't have it completely clear in my mind, but one is this problem of the, of the timing of the offers. So in this year, for instance, several universities, even in the top 20s, were waiting too many days for, for instance, MIT to make their first offer. Uh, so, if there were some way of coordination in the ordering of, of offers, maybe we could resolve something because there is this like a stackle bird game uh, going on. And to say that maybe there are incentives to do something like this, uh, in the US, my, uh, to the extent of my knowledge, is that for the PhD admissions, there is a, an agreement for the universities that actually at the end, uh, I think it's April 15th or May 15th, something like that, the offers are valid. So then you cannot make exploiting offers. That is something that also other universities exploit due to uncertainty. That's all, those are my thoughts. Very good. So I would, I would ask, so there's some uh, discussions going on on the chat, but then I'm a slow reader. So I wanna follow both. So I think we either all chat or we all talk <laughs> because otherwise I'm missing half of both. Um, so I don't know if Nick, Nick, you're raising a bunch of things through the chat that I think are worth, maybe we can all stop and read and then chat, or I don't know what we should do, but maybe Nick, you want to briefly mention these things? Yeah, I mean, I think there's so many different interesting angles being brought up. And so I was trying to use the chat to just kind of respond or, or synthesize questions. 
I would say if, if I've got like one minute to, to speak here, 30 seconds, I would say for me, I'd like to zoom out and go back to some of the questions that Laura and Alex raised, which is basically what are the problems that we would hope to solve with a centralized system? Because I'm, I'm very open to believing that there are a number of problems, but at a high level, it seems like one concern might be you're concerned that we're finding the wrong match, say, an, in, an unstable match. You know, there's a candidate who doesn't get a job, even though, you know, universities would have liked to hire them, or there's a university that doesn't fill its position because it interviewed the wrong candidates. A separate concern is maybe we're finding a reasonable match, but in an inefficient way that requires candidates to spend a whole year of their life, you know, searching and preparing for interviews and requires many, many faculty to spend a lot of time interviewing candidates that they're never going to hire. And I feel like the set of solutions that we would want might differ a lot depending on which of these problems we think are most severe and which ones we're trying to solve. And maybe that relates to Laudo's point of trying to get better data on this first. But, but I think it's really important to just start with what is the problem? Yeah, David. Cool, so that gives me the perfect transition, uh, which is to me, having recently been on, on the job market, the biggest problem is the timing. The issue that, uh, and Alex can testify because he was on the receiving end of some uh, panicked phone calls during my, my job market, uh, the, the situation where as a candidate, you have an offer, and there are quite a few, I think, exploding offers this, this year to try to take advantage of people's risk aversion. Uh, you, you get this exploding offer, it might be a decent option, not necessarily your favorite one, but your favorite one might not be able to give you uh, an offer until that one explodes. So you have to sort of take those trade-offs depending on how, how risk covers you are. I think you, you all understand the, the issue. And, and, and to me, that's the biggest problem here. The, the information aggregation, I found we're pretty good at that. I mean, it's not, it's not easy, but we're pretty good. Everyone has a job market paper. You can find everyone's website. Uh, we even, like the European Economic Association did something super cool this year, which was to ask candidates to do a 10-minute presentation of the job market. Um, as a candidate, you can find information about, uh, about um, departments. To me, to me, these are not the biggest issues. To me, the, the hard part is the decentralization problem, the fact that offers come at different times, and you might have to, to, to make difficult decisions. And so to me, where a centralized market would make sense would be at the very end. Uh, we, we, do, we do all of the interviews. We do all of the flyouts, just like we're doing them now. But we, we have a, a set time where, you know, by a certain date, we finish all of those uh, interviews, all of those flyouts. And, and the AEA has been giving some dates, uh, at least some, some target dates for these sort of things. And after this, places can, can make offers, but those offers might not be definite. You could, you could agree on some terms. You could, as a, as a department, say, we'd like, we're interested in hiring you. Here are the terms that we could, we could offer you. So that also goes back to what Alex was saying about the fact that we need to agree on terms and, and these terms are important. So we're going to pay you this much, just like we, we make offers now. But this offer just allows you to uh, compare your different offers and rank the departments, rank the, the offers in a lot of preferences. The departments can rank the, the candidates and then the centralization might make sense at, at this point. Uh, to me, from my recent experience and trying to think about this, this is the place where um, a centralized market would, would make most sense. Camille. Hi. Um, yeah, just I completely agree with the David's point. I think that was a, a very good point. But the, the comment I had is, um, so I think one of the differences I see between the job market uh, and school choice, for instance, is that in school choice, all the schools, or at least all the public schools participate because there is a city forcing everyone to participate. And I think a big difference I seem to perceive in the job market or the, the market for economists is that not all universities have the same incentives to join these kind of centralized scheme. And if even if you drop the top 10% of the universities who do not join the centralized system, then you would run the A on a partial market and the prediction you would have wouldn't necessarily be accurate. And I think this raises some important ethical questions because if you, I mean, either you have the whole market and then your prediction is good and you can use it, but using a prediction which is not 
so accurate. I think it's, it's a bit, seems a bit problematic to me. And, it, and from my experience, I think that when I was saying that universities seem to have different incentives to participate, I think that the top universities or top American universities, they seem to be pretty happy with the way it works. I mean, they receive applications from the top candidates and they end up hiring top candidates and all the top candidates are paying there. Uh, I think that where I've seen uh, very strategic behaviors is in the second tier universities who need to be strategic because they cannot, uh, they cannot have interviews only with the top candidates and they cannot uh, invite only the top candidates. So I think that there seems to be very clear differences in the incentives that they would have to join this centralized scheme. And I don't know if this is something you've considered, Andrew. Um, because, yeah, I, I like Alex's uh, suggestion of how to encourage universities to participate. Uh, but so in practice, I think it's a real, it's a real question. Uh, Andrew. Um, thanks for all these wonderful comments. They're super helpful and enlightening. Um, I just wanted to respond to a couple of them. Um, uh, some of them were directed at me or, 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 um, or I felt like I had something I could uh, respond to. So I think the most central one is, is there a problem at all? And um, so I have two kinds of evidence. One is just my private sort of experience. And the other is some survey information that we collected after uh, running the pilot a couple of years ago. So for, for us, we're always astounded by who was attainable that we had top coded at the end of the market. And we're always astounded who we were, uh, who we were pretty confident would be interested in us. Uh, and they, they had a wonderful market that just, that just blew us away. Um, so that's from the employer side. From the candidate side, I, I just know so many kids, especially kids coming from uh, great programs and, the, and they're not good enough for the top departments, uh, but for the middle departments, we all think that they're too good. And so I have a friend and he, he, had, he had a top publication. He has had two more top publications since he graduated a few years ago and he had no flyouts. And when his advisor went, was contacted by the schools that hadn't fly, flown him out, they thought, oh, well, we just knew that we weren't ever going to get this kid. And so, it, what, you know, a school that uh, flew him out and they made an offer the same day because they were, you know, obviously it was very good. Um, so I do think that there's just a lot of slippage. Um, and then finally, we surveyed departments after and uh, a lot, of, a lot. So I, I agreed that at the top, there's less demand. So Harvard and Princeton and you know Chicago, they know, and Stanford especially probably because of the weather, they know that they can get basically, uh, they can uh, fly out the whole field of people and that some one of those is gonna be very interested in their offer. But even a little ways down, I've heard at Northwestern that they have been surprised by the people that turn them down for preferences that couldn't have been known. Uh, geographic preferences or urban rural uh, preferences or just sort of idiosyncratic preferences for institutions and department structure that I think um, uh, is anyway I, I think that that's actually probably the, the best criticism of the of the of the recommender is how does it it doesn't work very well if the top isn't participating and uh, can you sort of plug that hole by by uh, inputting Sort of synthetic preferences where you kind of imagine who they would who they would be preferring, and just uh, plug them in if they don't uh, if they don't participate. Um, so I can't remember who what the name of the person, but they made a wonderful comment that uh, how how do candidates sort of should they be in fear if they're not recommended at a place that they had a good interview, and in practice if they're not recommended at a place it's because uh, that they had a good interview that they were that they were interested in. And that the other department was interested in them, it is only because they were recommended at places that they preferred, the candidate preferred more. And if you are really worried about the privacy aspect, do I reveal the fact that I wasn't interested by not being uh, recommended at somewhere that was very interested in me? Um, you can you can implement a differential privacy scheme by which you uh, randomly omit uh, one fifth or something like that of the recommendations, so that a department can't infer that you weren't interested by not being recommended. Uh, the incentives to participate, 
Um, I, I, I think that it all depends on, how, on the quality of the, of the information improvement provided by the matching. So if there's lots of heterogeneous, un, unobservable preferences, then there, and, and I think that's what we learned from the survey was that departments were very interested because they were, as, as we are, always astounded by who was attainable that they had top coded and who uh, wasn't attainable that they thought was uh, well within their, their reach. There was a, a question about how do you rank 100 schools or 500 candidates? And I think that this is a very important question. I, I think the, the solution would just be that if you can rank them into bins, so you can have a first bin, a second bin, a third bin, and you can make those as small or as large as you'd like. And then we, you know, the, the matcher would just randomly assign the order of those schools or candidates within each bin. And there's not much better that you can do about that. But if they're, if they're indifferent between them, then it, then it shouldn't matter. The diversity constraint, I think, is really important. What I'd say is that the recommender system is going to tell you which candidates are uh, the best attainable, including which diverse. So we've, we've gone after diverse candidates and then found out that everyone else was going after diverse candidates. And so if you, with, with the match, if it, is a, if it is a good recommendation, it's going to give you some information, some light about which of your diverse candidates are the best attainable. So it might actually be successful at promote. Instead, I do think there's a coordination failure on diverse candidates in particular. I think so many people are trying to get them at the same time that it's, it can be, um, that everyone can fail at the same time if, if they're not coordinated well. Um, I do, I would, I think that it would be great to coordinate after the flyouts. It's just very, I think all of the incentives for participating are especially eroded um, if you impose a, a, a flyout coordination period, in part because the administrative uh, timing of different institutions is so different across places, and because there would be an incentive to 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 just avoid the match uh, completely and make excluding offers before the coordination date. So while I think that that's a point where there's a lot of um, sort of strategy involved. Um, I, know, I I I think it would be really hard to implement. Um, and then there was one other thing I just wanted to say that I can't. Oh, and, and with that, in a recommender system, a candidate is more likely to receive offers from more similar schools, uh, flyouts from more similar schools. So whereas now you might have a flyout at Princeton, a flyout at Alabama, and a flyout at a community college at once, you're much more likely to have sort of um, flyouts that are concentrated in your best attainable range than all over the map. So the difference is if, if one school doesn't uh, come out and the, and, the, and the difficulties with timing are actually much smoothed if all of the, if your flyouts are more similar to one another and they're more and they're all in the in the more attainable range. I'm sorry, I'll I'll be quiet. Uh, Alejandro. Thank you. So my, my internet connection is actually quite sloppy. So if I just uh, black out, uh, just uh, skip me, please. So, um, I mean, I, 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 so first of all, I, I was in the market last year, and this year was the first time that I was able to see the other side of the coin. It was um, super interesting when I realized how, I mean, in my experience, how my feeling was that no one knew anything. As a student, I thought that universities had a lot more information. Um, and then, at least in my experience this year, I realized that, you know, what I'm hearing now, that universities also struggle to know a lot of information. And then another thing that I sort of experienced in the job market that I'm experiencing now is, is how much we don't know anything about it. So, like, there's a lot of rumors and everyone knows stories. Um, so, I mean, the, the one thing I just wanted to add is that the, the point I found most interesting was, was the data. So, so sort of, there's, there's data about this. And I, I had this idea about sort of a, a way to incentivize schools to give their data so that someone can look at this data. And, and I think that, that question, I think it's actually something we should ask and probably answer before thinking on, on to do something that changed the market and could have very, very terrible unintended consequences that could, you know, mess up with people's careers. Um, I mean, it seems to me that there's room for things that seem, I mean, they're sort of like suspect, right? Uh, so like if people have mentioned exploding offers, you know, people coming through the cracks, uh, you know, uh, jumping, 
you know, like typical things we already know about matching markets that happen with time. Uh, but something that caught my mind was, for example, that the, the AEA already has a lot of this information. So, for example, I got a survey asking, I don't even remember what they were asking, sort of interviews or fly outs. Uh, and here I'm going to, you know, sort of um, uh, uh, be a, a, a bit transparent. But I, I decided not to answer the survey because, you know, it was just spam. Uh, and then, you know, everyone, you know, everyone has its own market. And these are things, I mean, many people have said, have said it, right? Like, you don't want to tell your research allowance to other people. Maybe you don't want to, you know, other people to know your flyouts. Maybe your colleagues, you don't want to know, you know, you don't want to be telling people where you're applying an offer from. So this is data that is quite sensitive. And in the profession, not everyone is sort of, you know, fully comfortable with getting this data out of it. So I, I thought that actually just, thinking about how to aggregate this information so that someone can actually study and see if there's room for improvement, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. But yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah, I, I still think like whatever arguments, I so I wrote myself as a hand whatever also, huh? so this is just my, also my time. So I still think every point that you guys have raised, you could still find a case where we're ignoring that for some other market. So the fact that where there's all these outside options, definitely true for any market that we look at. No, there's outside options to everything. So even partial seeds are in some, uh, in Cambridge and so on, it's only partial part of the seats that are assigned through a centralized procedure and we still ignore all of that in, in the theory. So the only thing I'm saying is that use all these things because they can make us better matchmakers in the future. You know, all the things that you like take it further, like think about why all these things, you know, make a difference or not. Why are these, um, why does this lead to us saying we should not use it and what would be the problem of doing so? I think we need to, I, I, there's all these things that are coming up and I would like to take each of the ideas and make it, you know, uh, follow it truly. And I think there will be tons of papers that could be written about this, no? So I'm super happy about the this. So thank you very much for all the discussions because I think this has been super useful. And then Nick, uh, you asked for your turn and then Laura. I think that hand raised was from previously. So we can go on to Lauda. So um, I think, I'm not sure after what Katarina said, if I have uh, something really to add, but I, I, I just, my concern with the students welfare was not like privacy per se. And I think that this actually has to do with Bobby's point that in general to aggregate information or to give recommendations, giving point recommendations is not necessarily great because there's this might leak more information than we want to. So there are other ways in which we know, there we know nothing about DA as a mechanism for aggregating information. And so it might be that if that's what we're worried about, there are other, there are other things to do. And my concern was not privacy, but we're giving a point recommendation to a school in a, in a setting where I think that you might not want to reduce it to that because that you're not the school's best choice doesn't mean that at the end of the day when we actually find out how many offers we can make and like it could be that my first choice realizes that they cannot make an offer. And then I would have been very happy at taking a job at my second choice, but I now accidentally told my second choice that I'm not the best thing attainable for them. And this can, like, these are the things that I think we should be worried about when we're giving these uh, recommendations. And if these are in the minds of the students, this will affect the reporting. And then this will make the system be worse at giving uh, recommendations. And I guess I, I totally agree with Katrina's point that there's some things like outside options that we don't model in school choice, but they potentially should be modeled. But I do think that I wouldn't compare this to the recent matching program, especially because 
it seems like a lot of the information acquisition that we're doing is what I think it was Utku that mentioned this, that it's for a potentially long life matching. And this is why this is a way more complicated decision than being going, applying to some place to be trained uh, in a particular field, but it could also be that I'm not a doctor. Um, so I don't understand the, the big implications, but I think that getting it wrong it, it might be that getting, my impression is that getting it wrong now might be more costly than uh, which the, the residence program, but I'm, I, this might be just talking out, out of ignorance. Yeah, the thing is, we don't know whether we're getting it wrong. So we may actually be getting it much worse than the doctors are, even though it's such high stakes no, the stakes are super high and we're doing it worse because we haven't really, or, or no, maybe we're doing a very good job and we should just be aware even if the stakes are lower, do it this other way because it's a better way. I mean, we have a very, you know, information is centralized, the interviews are centralized, but then there's the signals. It's like such a, I don't think we've recommended any other market to look like ours, no? And then, and th so I think we should use all of that to like extrapolate and understand more. Like, can we do better? Maybe no, we're, maybe we're just doing excellent. Uh, but then maybe there's some learning to be done. So I think we should just, uh, whoever wants to be in the AEA should submit uh, data. Uh, you were talking about enforcing, no, making all these things compulsory. Maybe we can say something like this, no? Uh, can you please all provide your data? We really need this and, you know, Andrew is going to be like anonymizing everything to make sure that, you know, all the concerns that we always ask everybody who should give us data to ignore, we're not ready to ignore ourselves. So I think we should just, you know, we need to get data and start really thinking about whether we do have a problem. Maybe we don't, but some people seem to be um, willing to spend some time like thinking about whether there is a problem. I think there's a lot of people who think there is a problem especially the lower, middle, lower tiers of both sides. Um, but in any case, there's people willing to understand whether this is the case. And um, I think any learning will be having like lots of um, implications for all the other advices that we provide on others. So I think, um, um, Alex, do you want to go ahead? And then Estelle. Oh, I think Estelle was first, let me. Okay, let sorry. Me. Hi, very, um, thanks, uh, th thanks a lot for this round table, very interesting. So just wanted to go back to your earlier point, um, Katerina, about, you know, what, you know, that we, in all of these other markets, we do have uh, some of the features that people have been using to uh, argue why we want to keep the market as it is. I think that the, there are two first type of answers that have been given. One is that some of these issues might be first order, some of the, uh, and they might be second orders um, in, in, in our market. So I think Laura's point uh, saying that, you know, for residency, it's only a short term, short term versus a longer term is one example. The other issue is what's feasible. Uh, you can, can you impose participation? Uh, what are the uh, outside options? So that's, th these are points that have, have been made. One point maybe that hasn't been made is the issue of path dependency. In some ways, these markets have been evolving uh, to fix one problem at a time. And once you have a, uh, a market existing as it is, um, it may have problem, but it creates winners and losers to any improvement anyways, right? So when you move from one market organization to the other, there's going to be winners and losers. I think Thomas also mentioned uh, this point, and you've just mentioned some, some of these two. Um, and so I think maybe there's one optimal organization, but given given the way these different markets have emerged in school choice, you know, residency and all of these things, the path may not be leading to the overall overall uh, optimal outcome, uh, uh, I think, because of this path dependency. Okay, so my turn now. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, yeah. So I, I already uh, put it in the chat and, and I received uh, some, some reaction. Uh, so the question is, why don't we start s small if we understand the benefits? And yeah, we, 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 we seem to, at least uh, theoretically, um, uh, it should 
still remain a benefit for any sub, uh, subset of, of the market, right? So if you hire someone and I hire someone, we better do it collectively. Um, um, there, there are many caveats to that. Um, and um, on the negative side of this proposal, so that why, why don't we, uh, why don't we actually uh, do an on some uh, association that, that, that does it the, the way we like, uh, on the negative side, I see that um, even with my university, there are several uh, departments, several campuses in different um, uh, cities, and it is already difficult here. So we actually want to hide uh, what what we think about the candidates from from the others. On the positive side, I think uh, like the schools that are more experienced, uh, the, the top schools, for instance, I think they are, they are communicating uh, quite frequently. Uh, although I, I don't know, but that's my expectation. So over a year or so, they, they actually share uh, uh, which candidate they like more, and um, they share this information. So, um, but if there are some, maybe among us, maybe, maybe not. If there are some proponents uh, of of this centralization and information sharing, let let them speak up and and then try it next time, uh, and then see uh, if others join. That will be already an in, in improvement and already. Uh, uh, yeah, interesting case. I think also we've we've thought very much about the dangers. No, like what if I'm not in the list, and like this other department wants me, and I want them, and I'm not in the list. But think about the other cases as well. Like they really think I'm never gonna come, um, but then I'm in the list. You know. Uh, so it, you know, I think there is it can go both ways. I I don't think we know. I don't. I think we should just really get the data and 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 think about what data is okay to be collected so that we can start learning something, uh, something that like start with small questions. I don't know, but I think um, I think we don't know. And I think there's possible dangers and there's possible benefits. There's winners and losers for sure as Estelle was saying, but maybe making explicit who those are is going to make it also, you know, you're going to be a worse citizen if you know this is very good for like the worst departments and you're not like participating in the data collect, you know, if there's kind of a public good in all of this that I think um, we should really try and, you know, each one of us can talk to our institutions and maybe say, look, I don't know if it's good or bad for us. Um, the top, I think, really don't have anything to lose, really lose, no. You don't gain anything, but you don't have anything to lose either, no? So it's really, I mean, I don't know who the clear losers would be that would really feel comfortable saying, no, I'm not gonna participate. Um, so I don't know, I think it's, yeah, I don't think we can live without doing something. <laughs> it's like inventing the vaccine and then not winning, wanting to get vaccinated to me. It's a little bit how I'm feeling. I'm like, no, I'm okay. My immune system is pretty good. So I don't need a vaccine. And I'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> a little bit, not, not exactly. Because we do get, we have a vaccine that we fine tune. I mean, we do have like a very elaborate market um, that has, you know, is a result of a lot of thinking, but I think that it's a very different process than in others that it's worth thinking about why it's so different. Okay, so is anybody else, uh, I don't know, uh, Utku? So uh, one other thought, which I think I forgot to mention, um, from the department's point of view, uh, in a way, uh, this is a very common value uh, kind of an uh, environment, right? We, uh, everybody likes the stars in a way. If in the perfect market, they would hire the star, uh, the star would work for 10 departments, right? At the same time, uh, if, if it's possible. But, uh, and then there's this, uh, we, uh, as economists, I think we over uh, rely on market signals in the sense that, so I'm worried about actually some kind uh, like middle uh, candidates in a way that if the rankings become public early on, this can create a certain kind of, uh, so uh, in a way, uh, affiliated values, right? If you wish, some people get more value than they really deserve and it will accumulate uh, through this revelation of, uh, and some people will really lose out of this. So I don't know, uh, the effect of this, right? If, if you don't uh, appear in many, the commander lists or 
etc. Of course, the recommender list could be fixed, but uh, based on uh, whose recommender list you appear, uh, you may have a, uh, your value is constantly updated by the other departments, right? And later on, people may go out of their uh, lists, uh, etc. So I would like to hear if this is a valid concern. I don't know. Uh, what do you think? If we have time at all, maybe we don't. <laughs> Uh, sorry. I have a thought on that, but I don't want to. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so I think one way of thinking about this concern that Laura and Utku and others have talked about is the current system, for all of its potential flaws, is fairly strategically simple for applicants. Right? You apply everywhere. You wait to see what interviews and and flyouts you get. You take them all. Every school, you try to make yourself look as good as possible, and then you get some offers and you can make your final decision. So it's not necessarily efficient, but it's strategically simple. And I think the concerns that are being expressed, I kind of synthesize as saying, suddenly it may not be so strategically simple if you're asking me, where do I want to interview? And interviewing at one place actually means giving up an interview at another place. I think for schools, it's a lot less clear. I think for oh. schools, they have to be a lot more strategic. To totally, I agree. I think schools, it's not so strategically simple, but I think for applicants right now, the current system is fairly yeah. simple. And so in some sense, a change could shift the burden of strategizing away from schools and towards applicants, or at least to both sides. Alejandro. Uh, hi. So something I, I just, I mean, I, I just thought now, and and given what what someone was mentioning about outside options, uh, I mean, I thought that one piece of data that should be simple to recover is like uh, who who did the people? I mean, the people for whom the market failed, right? Because the, I mean, the concern is that you have a mismatch, right? Like if, if you have a that, that there are no many broken pairs, uh, but clearly, you know, in in I mean, according to I mean within the so, sort of like for people who are matched that that's sort of harder to get at right i mean i i have another school that i would rather want to go maybe even if they interviewed me or if they flew me out it doesn't have to be mit uh but you know i mean the sort of if things are working out what probably happened is that they ended up hiring someone who they liked more than me right um but in, in that sense, I mean, I think that the, the big concern would be something that someone mentioned, and, and that would be a very big concern for academia as a whole, that someone wants to be a professor and they don't find a job by March, and they, they say, you know, okay, it's going terrible, and they decide to go on banking, and that there was a school that, you know, they received 300 applications, they saw some, they flew some people out, they couldn't hire anyone, and they would have hired this person. Uh, because in a sense, that person is already out of academia. I mean, because also, I mean, a, a nice thing about academia is that in a sense, there's this feeling that it's meritocratic, uh, you know, even if you're on their place, uh, you know, people publish well, you know, people move, move up or down, there's a whole tenure idea. Uh, but I think that the, the one problem that could be severe, and, and people would, look at it, and I mean, we could generate interest, so if this is something that we should fix, is that if there's a lot of people leaving the market uh, and schools that are willing, that would be willing to hire them, but are not being able to find them, sort of, uh, you know, uh, the people uh, really, really fall to the cracks. Uh, and I just thought that would be a piece of data that doesn't seem that hard to reveal, like to, to find people who build it really feel that the market failed them. Uh, but I, I just want to ask that. I also feel like a little bit the criticisms, um, so the analogy to me is when people criticize AI algorithms, no, that make recommendations and they may discriminate and they may do all these crazy things, but at least you have them there so you can analyze them. And the question is, do the algorithms do a worse job than decision makers in general? So this whole point about how are these ranks created? Um, we believe that our intuitions or our 
talks and you know coffee breaks and whatever where we talk about candidates that's a better way of aggregating information um but we have no way of of really understanding whether that's true or not because we don't have data so i think uh i think it would just be amazing even if we didn't do anything we didn't change anything just get some data and see whether what we're doing is discriminatory whether there's a lot of mismatch whether there's a lot of i think all these things are valid questions um that some people feel like may not be a problem i'm not sure they're not a problem and i just think you know if having an algorithm puts a lot of structure in our thinking and even to say that the algorithm is is bad but then we can change it so i think i yeah anyways alex I just want to come back to a point that Nick made, which I think was a really good one, that in a way it is actually very simple for candidates. And I think that all the inefficiency and all the problems are created by the departments because we, and especially I think when this point has come back, like if you're at the very top, you know, it's all great. And if you're very, maybe if you're very at the bottom, uh, also things are just not very great in general. But if you're in the middle, that's exactly where um, Alejandro's stories of this mismatch uh, happen right you overestimate how good a, 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 a candidate might be um, and and that's where it happens and so in a way right we're really creating this product uh, not for the candidates I think so much right it's really very much from the perspective of universities and so in a way I was just uh, chatting to Andrew in the uh, in, in the chat I'm really sorry I'm breaking rules Katarina um, but in a way like you can kind of imagine trying to figure out what is the price as it were for every for every candidate who is who, who's coming in and like roughly figuring out which sort of price band you should be operating in right I mean this is just another way of trying to summarize what a DA is going to give you right but this is what I think the departments need. They need to kind of have a decent idea about whether they're going for some people who are going to be quote unquote very expensive or some people who are going to be kind of, if you like, reasonably cheap, right? And I think sometimes we just make pretty bad mistakes and we make these mistakes collectively now. If you know, it would be a bit, um, 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 of course, it has the potential to go really badly wrong precisely for the reasons that Laura pointed out so well which is that if everyone gets the same signal that somebody's not very good and it's just because the algorithm is crap we can do worse for this candidate um, than then they would have been absent of this sorry maybe I've just repeated a ton of things people have said already but it's just kind of synthesized a bit in my head Dorothea yeah um, I just wanted to add so I don't agree with your point that it's easy for the candidates. I have had many, you know, young people who uh, had exploding offers at some point had to accept them, try to renege, but it didn't work. And then they got more offers later on. And then, you know, you try to tell them that it's not so bad, uh, that, you know, uh, the, the other offer was good too. And sometimes it's not so clear, but this happens. So it's not, I don't think it's it's that simple. I mean, I, I agree up to the point that you describe. Yes, that's easy, right? To apply as much as you can and, you know, tell everyone you like them best. Uh, but then, you know, the, the difficult choices come later on and the market clears very slowly in the end. And then, you know, these, these things happen a lot. So I think there is scope for improvements and also for the, for the candidates. So I'm also a little bit on, on Katerina's side uh, that, you know, we, we shouldn't, I, I mean, you know, of course it would be great to have evidence, but we have lots of anecdotal evidence that things go wrong, right? And that's already something. And of course there is a, there is a, there is a question of who's gaining and who's, who's losing and uh, there, there will be both, but um, I think looking a little bit in a more structured way at, at what's going on and at the data and exactly at who's winning and who's losing, I think that would be would be very interesting uh, by itself uh, uh, to figure that out. So I think um, that would be worthwhile. Thanks. Laura. So I, I just had like a quick thought because the issue with the exploding uh, offers has been brought up several times. And, it, and I agree with Dorothea that that makes decision making difficult, but I'm not sure how a recommender system or any like the discussion that we're having now changes that because my understanding is that many like there's some constraints institutions have that come from like the econ department doesn't own the university, 
and it has to do with how offers are being processed through, for instance, the, the school the economics department is sitting on. Like I was, when I was in Caltech, we had basically control over, like we were given like a set of things we could do and it never goes back to the school until we're done. But I know some other schools where every time someone says no to your offer, the offer goes back to, let's say the social sciences division. And then that division has to decide, do you get the slot back for econ or it goes somewhere else? So I think that it's not that schools necessarily are making exploding offers because they're trying to push people. If that's happening, that is an inefficiency that we can address, but there are some things that are institutional constraints of this operating on a larger labor market that the uh, university cares about that I don't know how we can address with the things that we're discussing now. I'm more optimistic about that. I think uh, I wrote in the <laughs> again, sorry for Katerina, on the I think over time institutions will adjust. They already know that economics is weird. They we already have this centralized market, which is uh, kind of unheard of in some disciplines in uh, let's say uh, arts and sciences uh, colleges, uh, etc. So over time, I think there will be a move. Yes, initially I agree with you, Laura. Laura, uh, it will be bad some for some places, but over time I'm more hopeful. It can just push uh, everybody to be more uh, uh, punctual and timing uh, can matter because they will be totally shut out uh, once their deans know this. Uh, it will work out in their favor. Thomas. Yeah, thanks. So I just want to complement maybe a bit what um, Katerina and Dorofia said. Uh, I, I also agree with that the point that Nick um, made that strategic simplicity is a good is a good property, but that does not mean at all, right? That candidates are not going to be willing to move to a different match where there is some strategy, but they could get way better matches in expectation. So just one, just one example of this is that what, the problem that happens when American students try to apply to the European institutions is super hard, especially for top 20 candidates to actually make it credible to the European institutions that you really want to go to Europe, unless you are from Europe or you have a fiance in Europe or something like that. So then advisors start calling, uh, so there are a bunch of signals that they're already doing. And there is, that, that breaks a bit the simplicity, right? Because it's not only where do we apply to, but also where do we kind of like put our efforts in uh, which departments to call and so on and so forth. And the other point that I, that I wanted to say is that maybe there is something that we can do even with the current data. The, we, we can extract maybe some information about the notion of the mismatches with uh, by analyzing the signaling mechanism. I, I know that the EA has done some analysis, but nothing too deep. Here, I just know that students, at least from the top 20s, they seem to take this seriously, the, the, the signaling mechanism. I don't know from your side, from the side of the universities, if you actually uh, look at the signals or not. But there, the student has to balance a bit preference intensity with probability of the match, right? So maybe there is something to, to get there. Yeah, very briefly, I also wanted to say about the strategic simplicity on the demand side, uh, also personal experience. When I was on the market, I wanted to go back to Barcelona. But then if I just applied to Barcelona, Barcelona people would be like, no. She's not being, you know, she's not looking, she's not being ambitious. She just wants to, you know, retire or whatever you want to call it, no? So I had to go through everything and make sure that, you know, and so probably wasted a lot of people's time, uh, uh, right? Pretending that I wanted to go to all these different places that I really did not want to go, but just so that I could get the right offer so that, you know, I could just say to Barcelona, okay, I'll come back, but you know, um, so it's, I don't think it's that simple. It's, I think it's all about really the middle grounds 
I think that the people that are very top, both department and candidates, they have an easier time, but it's those in the middle that you have to be, you know, you can, you know, I think it's... But Katarina, the issue that you and Dorothea raise, right, that the only way in which we can fix the exploding offer thing is by centralizing the match, right, in the final stage. But if we centralize the match in the final stage, then we don't need a recommender system because then we just go to Otko's kind of... I wasn't saying exploding offers, which I agree. I think that's more like deadlines than, than like organizing deadlines. And that's, I mean, in school choice, right. the same thing happens, huh? You get an initial match, but then you get uh, free seats, and then there's more and more, and the, you know there's it takes forever. And schools have to start in September, so that you know. Sir, but the, my daughter was accepted the day before school started, and that was because of free seats. And then we simplify everything else except our our world. Um, so I think uh, everything uh, that happens there. I'm just saying I, I'm just not not um, taking the point about the exploiting offers. Just the informational, like the the fact that our side is easy, no, like for looking for a job is an easy task that you just need to be honest and everything will be fine. Well, no, you cannot say I want to go back to Barcelona because then the profession is gonna think maybe I don't know what, and you have to pretend and then like uh, pretend to Florida and Miami that you will be going, you know, I don't know. Uh, so it's not as simple. So it's not only the exploding offers. I think there's other. Anybody else? Well, actually, I think the we we agreed until one minute from now. So I, this is perfect. Um, now, so who's going to summarize all of this <laughs> and write a report so that we can know? I think this is going to be recorded. So, or, or this has been recorded. It would be really nice if some students or somebody. A uh, great public provider could summarize and think about all these questions and um, think about the data that we already have, maybe the signal stuff. Is there is there something we can, I don't know, we're very, being very creative at, at like uh, inferring data from minimal data and other setups. Maybe here we can also learn from, I don't know, something. So anyways, thank you all of you. I don't know how we're supposed to close this, but I think this was a really interesting discussion. And I really hope we can do something to move forward in understanding better. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and especially Andrew and Katerina uh, for uh, starting it. Um, so um, it was a long day or night, depending on, on where you are now. Um, uh, you can continue uh, talking, chatting, uh, discussing in the lobby. Um, otherwise, see you tomorrow. Um, thank you.